continuing now talking about baptism, there's a, a couple of things we want to to mention. A note uh, about the ordinance of the church. Um, the Catholic Church holds to seven sacraments. Most Protestant denominations recognize only two sacraments. And Baptists have never felt comfortable with the term sacraments, and uh, since, hence we use the word ordinances. Uh, ordinances differ from sacraments in that ordinances do not convey grace to the recipient. So we are not, Baptists are not sacramental. Whereas the Catholic Church and other Protestant denominations, and many of them, and some, maybe not some evangelical ones, but uh, many other denominations are sacramental. So they see that the, or what we would call the ordinances, and what the Catholic Church even has more of, are rites or rituals which convey grace. In other words, they are like a conduit and they transmit grace to the believer. Ordinances don't do that. They are simply something we observe. And, uh, and they are not something that we do in order to get grace. So that is a distinction there. Defining baptism, we're going to start with that. The Concise Dictionary of Christian Theology defines baptism as an act of Christian initiation in which water is applied to a person by dipping, pouring, or sprinkling. So the CDCT does not, it, it's, it does not take a position on the validity of the mode of baptism, but notes that these are three options that have been uh, embraced. The Westminster Dictionary of Theological Terms says baptism is the initiation into the Christian faith through a worship ceremony in which water is applied by sprinkling, which is called aspersion, pouring, which is called effusion, or immersion, while the Trinitarian formula is spoken. So, again, noting that this is a rite, generally a part of a worship experience, worship ceremony, and again, noting that there are different modes of baptism that are practiced. So it's not the job of either of those dictionaries to argue for a particular mode. Historically, looking at baptism, the earliest evidence in the church uh, points to believers' baptism. Uh, really, we have two issues when we talk about baptism that we're going to discuss. Um, who is a candidate for baptism? And so that has to do with whether someone is a believer or not, and then how you would administer it, or what mode you would use, whether it's sprinkling, pouring, or dipping. And so we'll talk about those. Um, you, the unambiguous testimony of the, bat, of the baptism for infants appears only about the middle of the first half of the third century. And this is where we get into the believer's baptism or not. Is someone able to know what they are doing and actually be baptized as a believer, an infant or a very young child or something like that, you do not have the, the cognitive ability to understand what's going on, and so then that would not be seen as believer's baptism. The Didache uh, is one of the most ancient documents outside of the New Testament, has over 70 rules for baptism, but doesn't say anything about infants. Uh, the requirement for instruction infers the candidates were believers. The Shepherd of Hermas and the Letter of Barnabas both of those from the first half of the second century seem to presuppose believer's baptism. Clement of Alexandria in 200 AD discusses both baptism and scriptures concerning children, but says nothing about infant baptism. So we're seeing the idea of infant baptism is developing probably a little bit after the, the church has been established for a while. Tertullian uh, which is 160, his dates 160 to 220, wrote an entire volume against the practice of baptizing infants. So for him to write against it, it seems like there are those that are practicing it, or else why would he have written against it? So this is the, the end of the second century, beginning of the third century here. Origin, same time frame, about 15 years difference in starting uh, for Origin, and a little later on for his, uh, for his, the rest of his life argues for infant baptism, claiming it is part of the apostolic tradition. It's evident that pedo-baptism was a matter of strong debate. So we can see that where this is happening in the church. And the Council of Carthage, in 253, takes pedo-baptism for granted. It appears to be widely practiced at this time. So, from the time of the founding of the church until um, the, around the 200s, then you start to see arguments, and then about 250s it seems to be settled that uh, pedo-baptism is widely practiced 
in the churches at that time. So within, you know, 150 years or so of, well, 200 or so years of the church, we start to see this practice uh, pretty much be taken for granted. What about the meaning of baptism? Well, in sacramental theology, baptism uh, conveys or gives initial grace and affects the effects of original sin are, re, are erased. So it is important then that someone is baptized because through that act, they get the grace initially of salvation and the effects of, their, of our original sin then are set aside or erased. So if you're sacramental, then it's very important that this happens because there's certain things that take place in baptism. Covenant theology, baptism is a New Testament equivalent of circumcision in the Old Testament. It's the sign and seal of the covenant. So it is important to identify you as a New Testament believer. So that's why uh, it's important. In Baptist theology, baptism is identification with Jesus. It's the believer's testimony of the subjective reality of his union with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So it's more symbolic for Baptists than it is in sacramental groups and even in covenant theology, but covenant theology is is similar in that regard. Uh, what about the method of baptism? Um, arguments, we've got a couple of different arguments here, kind of cases going through um, whether you should immerse someone or not. Uh, so we're going to look at this uh, very, very quickly. Baptizo has a secondary meaning to bring under the influence of, and sprinkling better portrays this. So that's one of the arguments, is uh, baptizo does not mean just dipping. Primarily it does, but it also has this meaning of bringing under the influence. Sprinkling or, or pouring might even better portray that rather than put dunking. Um, it's one of the arguments. If baptism portrays the spirits coming upon a person, then pouring or sprinkling, sprinkling better portrays this. Immersion would have been impossible or at least unlikely in Acts 2.41. Uh, there would be too many people. Or Acts 8.38, there would be too little water. And Acts 10.47 um, and 1633, too little water in a house. So I argue, well, probably they didn't put them under there um, because of either too many people or too little water. Baptizo is used to include all sorts of Old Testament rituals, including those that involve sprinkling. Um, and then the response to that, the bap baptisms in Hebrews is best translated washings. The sprinkling canon does take uh, place, does picture scriptural, spiritual cleansing. And the Greek language has a word that unmistakably means dip. Why isn't that used if it's the correct mode? So a grammatical question there. Arguments for immersion. Baptizo primarily means immerse or dip. The normal understanding of the prepositions into and out of the water would in, indicate immersion. So you wouldn't go into something if you're being sprinkled. You wouldn't come out of it if you're being poured on. Okay. Uh, proselytes in Judaism were baptized by total immersion, though they did it themselves. So that we do have other historical precedents that point to the same kind of idea. Immersion best pictures the significance of baptism, which is death to the old life and resurrection to the new. Immersion was the universal practice of the early church, and in every instance in the New Testament either demands or permits it. There were at least five pools around Jerusalem where 3,000 could have been baptized on Pentecost. Uh, and then again, that's assuming that it was... Uh, uh, the, the assumption here is there's enough water. Uh, they could have baptized these people, and um, you don't have to have poured on all the people. Um, and the Greek language has words for pour and sprinkle, but they're never used of baptism. So you, again, you have another linguistic uh, point here, uh, but in the different other direction. So baptism is a question. Many Baptists don't have an issue with that. The question that some have is, uh, what do you do with people who may be wanting to join your church who were not baptized by immersion. What do you do with them? And uh, there you can get different questions. I, my perspective on this is that uh, you need you two things are required for it to be baptism. One is you need a believer, and the second is you need immersion. So I don't 
think that if you have, if you're missing one of those two, you don't have what we understand as baptism. So, in my experience, I was raised Catholic, so I was had my head dunked as a baby. I uh, joined the Methodist Church with my family in uh, middle school, high school, and I was poured on. And then, as a Baptist later in life, I was immersed. So I'm pretty much covered. I think, but what I would say to people is that I was not actually baptized until I became, until I was immersed, first of all, because I was not a believer in either of the inst- previous two instances. And, um, and I don't think that pouring or head dunking or, or the aspiration, uh, the sprinkling is sufficient for baptism. Now, are there times when perhaps it's impossible to dunk someone. Yes. And uh, what do we do in that case? Well, we realize that baptism is an ordinance and it's not a sacrament. So if someone is not baptized, then it doesn't affect their salvation uh, if that's, if it's not possible to baptize them. So, but we should baptize when we can. And, um, anyway, moving on, communion will wrap up. Our discussion, Holy Communion, uh, is a term frequently used for the Lord's Supper. The, these are all from the Westminster Dictionary of Theological Terms. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament of communion or the Eucharist. It celebrates the death of Christ, his presence with the church, and his future kingdom. It was instituted by Jesus as the Last Supper, the last meal which Jesus shared with his disciples before his crucifixion. And the term Eucharist is a term for the Lord's Supper, deriving especially from Jesus' prayer of thanks for the bread and wine, which is related uh, which he related to his body and blood given for those he loved. So, in other words, the term Holy Communion or just Communion, Lord's Supper, and Eucharist are all synonymous terms, though Baptists tend to not use uh, the Eucharist. And we probably very don't use Communion very much. Um, but anyway, they are all just synonymous terms. Um, looking at the institution of the Lord's Supper, there's a direct connection with the Passover meal, and we see the command or words of institution are given by Jesus in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and 1 Corinthians, we see that. Interestingly, no mention in John's Gospel. Significance for the Lord's Supper. There's a uh, past, present, and future aspect to the Supper. Uh, past is looking at what Jesus has done. Present is looking at uh, the communion that we have, celebrating, proclamation, examining, and, and all of that present realities. And then a future anticipation of sharing the Supper together. So we have those aspects as well that are there. What happens to the elements? This is an area where there's some uh, confusion or there's some discussion. And so we want to take a little bit of time and look at that. There's a lot of discussion, a lot of debate about, uh, or there has been historically, I guess, about the elements in uh, taking communion for the Lord's Supper. So what is going on there? And some of us have heard some views, perhaps if you were raised Catholic, you understand uh, transubstantiation a little better. If you're raised Lutheran, you may know uh, consubstantiation, or, or you may, some of you may, uh, if you've been raised Baptist or evangelical, you, then you really probably don't have much of a connection or understanding. You've just maybe heard some things. But uh, when we look at the different views, we see that uh, they are quite different. We're going to look at four views of the Lord's Supper. The first is transubstantiation. This is, of course, the Catholic view. And this sees that when you take communion, the elements that you take, the bread and the wine, actually become the body and the blood of Christ. So in transubstantiation, you are actually eating Jesus' body and actually drinking his blood. But of course, for anyone who has taken communion in the Catholic Church, it doesn't taste like a body, it doesn't taste like someone's body, and it doesn't taste like blood. So how can you have that? And and that is the idea here that um, you, you have this position defended by stating that the essential nature of the elements 
becomes the body and the blood of Christ. But the accidental nature of the elements remain what they were, so the bread and the wine. And this gets into some philosophical distinctions here that are saying, yes, the bread and wine actually become the real body and blood of Jesus so that we are faithful in actually uh, eating his body and drinking his blood. And that goes back into John uh, where the, many people leave after hearing Jesus telling them, if you don't eat my body and drink my blood, you don't have any part with me. And that's taken very seriously here. And so the Lord's Supper is seen in transubstantiation as actually becoming the body and the actual blood. But only in the essential, the essence of the, of the elements, not in the accidental qualities of the elements. And so the accidental qualities are these, the way that it appears to us physically, and that's not the most important part in, um, in the ontological aspect of what something is. And so it accidentally looks like bread and wine, and accidentally does not mean, you know, it was mistaken or anything. It just means in its actual characteristics, it was actually bread and wine until it is blessed by uh, the priest until the, the the little ritual prior to communion takes place, then what continues to look like bread and wine actually becomes the body and blood of Christ. And so when people take communion in a transubstantiation view of the Catholic Church, they are actually eating the body and blood of Jesus. They are the real body and blood of Jesus, and they just happen to look like wine and bread. And so you'll notice that there's a lot of care taken with the elements of the Lord's Supper because you don't want to drop it, you don't want to spill it because it's actually Jesus' body. So it's cared for very, very much so. With consubstantiation, you've got a different view. The Lutheran view is very different from the Catholic view, but from our perspective, and I can draw this on the board at some point, from our perspective, it looks like it's very close. But consubstantiation, um, the body and blood of Christ are present, but they are not the elements. They are in, with, and under the elements. And um, so Luther, when he is breaking with the church, he still sees the importance of the presence of Christ, but he realizes, look, this is um, this can this presence doesn't have to be seen as changing the nature of the elements. It's still they're still bread, they're still wine. They haven't they're not actually something different now, but Jesus is actually there. He's hidden in the elements, and uh, Luther doesn't uh, want to deal with Zwingli and and uh, and his idea of seeing. Communion only as a memorial, and we'll get to that in a bit. Now, both both of these positions do see this as a memorial, but they see that as, as something else as well. So there's an importance in actually having Jesus in the uh, communion elements. Now, from our perspective, way on the other end of the spectrum, transubstantiation and consubstantiation look very close to us, but I suggest that if you were standing in transubstantiation and you moved to consubstantiation, that 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 is a huge leap. And so Luther made a huge leap to move from the position of the church that the elements were actually the body and blood of Christ to the position that the elements are not the body and blood of Christ, but that the body and blood of Christ are in the elements hidden within them. That is a, that is a significant move to make. From our perspective, way on the other side, though, it looks very minimal. So we should not diminish the, the radical change that it is to go from transubstantiation to consubstantiation. Though from our side, it just looks like it's a minor difference. It is a big deal if you are in one of those two positions and you're moving uh, in, the, in a direction away from it. Okay? Um, so a... Oops. 
a spiritual view is the next uh, view, and that's a reformed position. The body and blood of Christ are spiritually present in the elements, so they are there, uh, but not in a physical way, not hidden under the elements physically. Uh, they didn't become the elements in a transubstantiation view, but they are there in a spiritual sense. So there's a spiritual presence within the elements from within Reformed theology. And then a Zwinglian view, is memorial view, Christ is spiritually present with believers when they gather in his name. The table is the testimony of grace already received. Historically, this is a Baptist position. So Christ is present to believers, and so we don't have to, to consume him since he is present to us, is uh, the idea here. And so the Zwinglian view, the memorial view is... That communion is a memorial, memorial of what's going on, and um, this is this is the kind of the most minimalist view because each of the other views are going to see yes, it is a memorial. In fact, you read the Catholic teaching; they do see communion as a memorial, but they don't see it simply as a memorial. So, uh, the Zwinglian view, which has historically been a Baptist position, has stripped communion down to a minimalist idea that. Jesus is present in believers, and so the, you don't have to consume him, and uh, and it reduces communion to only a memorial, whereas the other views see communion as both a memorial and as a conduit, and as an act of actually communicating grace to individuals. So, um, so that's important for us to notice that distinction. What about the, per, the participants in the Lord's Supper? Uh, pretty much all, all denominations agree that you shouldn't indiscriminately administer communion. Um, you should distribute communion to people who are disciples. You've got a couple of issues. What about age? What about small, unbelieving children? Um, you know, Generally, they may be pro prohibited uh, from partaking in the Lord's Supper because they, they're not converted. They're not capable of self-examination. They can't discern, discern the spiritual and theological significance of the elements. And the point of, of that is that conversion is an issue. So sometimes small children are not allowed to participate in there, or someone who is not a believer is not allowed to participate. Uh, the idea of open communion versus closed communion. If it's open, anyone may participate who is a believer. If it's close communion, then those of like faith and practice may, may be invited to participate. If it's a closed communion, only members of the local assembly may participate. So this is uh, this is interesting, and we we sometimes use um, we'll see distinctions like this. You may go to churches and say, "Hey, if you're a believer, you uh, you can participate. Doesn't matter. That would be open communion." If you say, "Hey, um, we are," if you are. Um, you know, if you agree with us on essentials, maybe if you're an evangelical, um, things like that. Maybe if you're just visiting from one Southern Baptist church and you're visiting another, then uh, you may say that's that's close communion. If you share certain things together, you're welcome to participate with us. That's close communion. Closed communion would be only members of the local assembly would participate. And you'll see that in in some churches, some Baptist churches, and those particularly with landmarkist flavors. Um, that you must be part of that congregation to participate so that uh, church discipline and things like that could be exercised when appropriate. Uh, interestingly, I also th think that uh, the Catholic Church has had a position of closed communion. If you uh, go and, and read what they, what they say, uh, they, they ask only Catholics. And since they view themselves as a single church, not as a collection of different churches, then I, I think it would be appropriate to say that the Catholic Church has uh, has practiced closed communion, but they are in fellowship or in communion with uh, the Orthodox churches, so perhaps we could say that in some cases it's close communion there. So um, going on, the idea of self-examination in 1 Corinthians, what is we're talking about when we say unworthy, uh, someone taking the supper unworthily, and uh, what this really refers to is the manner in which the supper is observed rather than the worthiness of the participant. So uh, if you look closely at that passage, you're, see, you're seeing there that the, uh, the 
the thing that is the problem is that some people are getting drunk and some people are, have nothing, and so they're really not observing the Lord's Supper. Uh, I think that you fix that by distributing it to all people, and uh, and then you've avoided that that issue. So, um, seeing that a level should you repent and um, should you confess sin, yes, you should do that at all the times. But as a um, is that what's talked about here often is is referenced in this passage? I don't think so. Um, so. Um, how it is to be administrated, Scripture doesn't say a lot about that as far as who, who is to pass things out or things like that. Um, and then how frequently should we take the supper as often as ye will. It doesn't give um, a very clear thing. You know, in, in our bylaws, sometimes our bylaws tell us exactly how once a quarter or once a month or whatever, but uh, the Scripture doesn't tell us how frequently we are to take communion. Unity of the church. Um, and as we're flying along here, just uh, going to wrap up pretty soon. <sighs> Unity of the church is defined by Grudem as the degree of freedom within, from division among true Christians. The Westminster Dictionary of Theological Terms defines unity of the church as the essential oneness of the Christian church on the basis of its theological unity with God through Jesus Christ, maintained by the power of the Holy Spirit. Conceptions of unity and um, uh and the nature of unity, spiritual unity, is a view that understands Christians to be united if they are committed to and serving Jesus Christ. The absence of hostility to one another is the presence of unity. Different congregations and different traditions in the same area are not problematic for unity. So if you're going to say we have spiritual unity, that means we're all working together. Hey, it doesn't mean we're all listening to one bishop or one leader. We have our own traditions, our own practices, but if we all get along together and we're all working for the same, we'd say, hey, that's unity. Okay? Uh, another level of unity would be mutual, mutual recognition and fellowship. Uh, congregations recognize other congregations as legitimate members of the body of Christ. Maybe you can transfer membership from one to another. You can cooperate with one another. So this is maybe more of what we see in some like Southern Baptist churches or other affiliated churches where they, they recognize one another and they do some things together. Uh, that would be another wet level of fellowship. That would be more than just spiritual unity. It would be more uh, mutual recognition and some things together and some kind of uh, connection there that's beyond the fact that we're all just believers and working in the same direction. Conciliar unity uh, would have alliances for common purposes, councils or associations formed to facilitate cooperation while retaining individual or organizational identity. So maybe you have councils that have authority over churches, and that would be unity, where you submit to certain councils or groups you have some individual identity or you have your own individual identity, but you affirm and you agree with and submit to councils and uh, or associations that are larger than the individual body. And then organic unity, one organization without individual distinctions. And that is the kind of unity that the Catholic Church seeks and, uh, and claims that that is it, the only way that you have unity there. Uh, basically, if everyone is submitting to the authority of the Pope uh, or the, the bishops in communion with the Pope and those kind of things. So those are some of the different views or different uh, ways we could see unity in the, in the church. In the New Testament, there's a strong infinite emphasis for unity, and Paul emphasizes this, but exactly... What view of unity are we going to be uh, pushed towards? Are we going to accept? That seems to be one of the questions that we're going to answer. So uh, different churches are going to answer that differently, and um, we have our reasons for doing so. All right, that's the conclusion of our lecture on ecclesiology.